Good afternoon, friends, and welcome to this 10th of 12 installment of our webinar series on geology in the mining sector. Today, we are diving in restoration. Uh, more specifically, we are moving on to our fourth and final block, which will cover the entire sector, the, the entire mining sector. So um, we started off going wide with, you know, the geology, specific geology. And we, we went deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And now we're going back wider, but with specific application in the real world. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, we are exploring restoration today. Uh, very interesting subject, uh, especially given how the law has changed over the past decades. Mm -hmm. So you'll definitely uh, learn some interesting tidbits there. Um, if you have any question uh, during the duration of this webinar, feel free to write them in the uh, right-hand corner of the screen in the chat box. We'll uh, grab that information and pass it along to Francine at the end of the webinar. If you are watching the replay, as usual, send all your questions to info at iddpnql.ca. Once again, that information goes to Francine and it, we get the, them answers right back to you. Uh, without further ado, Francine, floor is yours. Thank you. So welcome to this new block. I'm gonna share my screen. And voila. And we're good to take off. Thanks, okay. So thematic block four, the three lessons are restoration, legislation and industry of the future. Restoration um, separated into seven general subjects. Uh, I'll have a, a bigger part on the environmental impacts of the mineral exploitation. We'll uh, fit that in within the mining cycle, the overview and the updated uh, guidelines. The closure requirements, um, an example of exploration to production projects, what kind of permits are needed, uh, the mine rehabilitation in the future, and the new, uh, newest pan Canadian minerals and metals plan. So to start, I went to get the, the CIM, the Canadian Institute of Mining, Best Practices for Mining in Canada. This is a great guide for you to start and read. Um, also, for this lesson, I've included, uh, given to Shao, uh, several uh, PDF files um, that regroups the official uh, guides that I'm covering here today. So if you have any interest, you can have the PDF files. And I also included in this um, presentation uh, all the website links if you want to go directly on the website. So mining activities has an important impact on the environment. Mining industries are heavily regulated in Canada and must follow social and political regulations. Contrary to uh, what several people think, uh, these regulations uh, include the land use, uh, many government policies, environment policies, and First Nations and their respective treaties. Mining companies must provide plans to preserve the environment and reclaiming the land that are now included in every mining operation budget. So many of the environment impacts, um, horror stories we have seen from the past are now within the past because the industry is very heavily regulated to prevent any of these uh, new horror stories. So the mining industry impacts directly affects the entire microeconomy as we know it. Uh, it has also some, we're talking about ne negative impacts, but we also need to talk about positive impacts. So some of these positive impacts are improving the infrastructure, increasing employment, developing rural, rural communities, because a lot of the rural communities would not exist or would live with uh, practically no jobs or any possible possibility to open uh, or enable any new spin-offs and downstream business. So 
mining industry has a lot of what we call direct and indirect impacts, both negative and positive. I've included here down, down here the, the main domains that the uh, mining industry impacts, both positive and negative, negatively. So uh, most of these impacts are in what we call the environmental and social category. And these can include uh, local communities, local cultures, wealth, unequal distribution, waste management issues. It has, like I said, I said positive impacts like poverty alleviation, local financing support for either businesses, festivals, uh, municipality devo development, and so on, air quality, water quality, and biodiversity and wildlife. The most significant impact of mining projects is their possible effects on land and water quality. So the first part of my presentation, I've done a total list uh, with examples of every kind of impact you can have, not just in Quebec, not just in Canada, but in the world. And it will show the processes, the main processes that can cause environmental, environmental damages. And I've also included some examples of how these can be uh, controlled. So the first one, noise and vibration. So the sound pollution associated with mining may be of various types. Example, the impact is especially for nearby communities. This has been uh, lived by uh, many communities in the Abitibi area, especially uh, late, uh, one of the later examples is in the uh, Malartic town. Vibrations are associated with many types of equipment used in mining operations, but blasting is considered the major source. Um, these impacts can cause what we call subsidence or collapsing. It's basically the land uh, is collapses caused by poor soil compaction or from subsurface and underground mining. Uh, the vibrations can cause houses to fill sewer lines to crack, gas main plumbing to break. Here is a drastic example. It's not always as this bad. Um, I've know, I know some examples in the Valdon area before, uh, the, before the change of the open pit um, in the town from uh, to El Dorado. Um, it was the first, I think it was century mining. And many of the houses near uh, would complain about uh, fissuring by cause to vibrations, sewer lines, and plumbing, and etc. Every time the mine would uh, undergo uh, blasting, this can be reduced by a, a good compaction of the soil and leaving support pillars in deeper underground mines, but also by planting. Um, some of these blasts um, and making sure now that was a, a big problem in the past because the cities were not well uh, developed. Um, the infrastructures were not well developed. So a lot of these houses were built too close to the mining site. This would not happen today. Uh, for pollution, we also have air, air and noise pollution. So air, whatever can be, can produce dust. Um, the dust can be reduced by water sprays. The noise, the noise can be reduced by uh, baffle mounds and restricted times for blasting. Uh, a lot of the mines now uh, don't blast all day long. They have restricted schedules to respect. The air quality, uh, while the mining operations mobilize large amounts of material and waste piles containing small size particles, uh, which are easily dispersed by the wind. Um, same principle as a natural volcano, uh, the ashes would go around the air, same principle. Um, airborne emissions occur during each stage of the cycle of the mine cycle. The mining operations um, 
mobilize large amounts of material and waste piles containing small sized particles, which are easily dispersed by the wind. And the airborne emissions occur during each state of the mine cycle. Uh, we have two types of um, air quality that can be damaged uh, by either mobile sources. Mobile sources, so the level of polluting emissions from these sources depends on the fuel and the conditions of the equipment. Mineral transportation can produce noise, fumes, dust, and cause traffic accidents. And these can most of the time be reduced by either water uh, spray or by mines or mine projects creating alternative uh, route choices that they will build for their own uh, product transport. Major source of particles matter like carbon monoxide and volatile organic compounds uh, can be dangerous for local communities. We have the stationary sources. Well, the stationary sources are basically within or on the mine development site. So the main gaseous emissions are from combustion of fuels and power generation installations and drying, roasting, and smelting operations like any other manufacturer uh, domain uh, uh, company. Typically for gold and silver, um, is produced like in, in, in melting or flux through furnaces. So that may produce elevated levels of airborne, mercury, arsenic, sulfur dioxide, and other, me other uh, metals. We also have what we call the fugitive emissions. Fugitive emissions are um, sporadic, random, and these are the ones we need to watch out for because sometimes they happen after several months, after several years. So we need ongoing um, studying of these emissions. So these regroup any emissions which could not reasonably pass through a stack, chimney, vent, or other functionally equivalent opening, like storage and handling of materials, mine processing, putrid dust, blasting, uh, construction activities, associated roadways, leach pads, tailing piles, ponds, and waste water, waste rock piles. The air quality, um, one of the major incidents are is the release of mercury. Uh, the mercury is a natural occurring element. So that is found in air, water, and soil. So um, just opening a bracket here from now on in my presentation, you'll see that a lot of the environmental damages are caused um, ironically by natural elements. So most of the mining pollution is caused by the mix of natural elements which react chemically with the environmental ele uh, elements where it is stored. And this, unfortunately, is a chemical process that if it is not uh, well monitored, will develop. So the companies always have their own uh, environmental uh, department now to do the follow-ups before, uh, uh, while the mine is ongoing and at the closure. So coming back to mercury, mercury is considered by uh, the World Health Organization as one of the top 10 chemicals or groups of chemicals of major public concern. A too long exposure to mercury, even small amounts, may cause serious health problems. Um, mercury is commonly present in some gold ore and is associated and therefore is associated in waste material. Uh, ironically, mercury is one of the trace indicators for when we're searching gold. During metallurgical processes, mercury is in the ore is uh, vaporized, particularly in roasters. If not collected by air pollution control devices, this mercury could be released to the atmosphere and impact the environment and public health. An example is um, for uh, mercury in gold ore, for 10 milligrams per kilograms, 
and 1 million tons of ore processed in a particular mine, which is a uh, usual concentration, we would create 10 tons of mercury, which would potentially be re released to the environment if it was not well monitored. I have included the National Geographic uh, video uh, showing mercury poisoning. I'll let you uh, look at it at your own time. And I also included another video uh, for the Uran uranium mining in Niger and the air quality it has caused. So moving on, other type of pollution, moving on from uh, uh, air and noise, we, we're moving on to the next important one would be water. And mainly it is like a turbid drainage water. So this can be reduced by sedimentation lagoons and filtration. Most of the water pollution, again, is caused by the mix of a chemical reaction between two groups of natural elements combined together will create this pollution by their chemical process, unfortunately. Uh, toxic leaches uh, can be reduced by chemical treatment. So that is why now uh, all mining projects and sites have their environmental department to do all these follow-ups and checkups before they, they occur. And if they occur, to get them right at the start. Tailings impoundments, waste rocks, heap leach, and dump leach facilities are also a big checkup. Tellings is a high volume waste that can contain harmful quantities of natural toxic substances. Again, these are all natural, uh, coming out of the rocks, uh, arsenic, lead, cadmium, chromium, nickel, cyanide, etc. These have to be watched out in the tellings uh, sitting there and not chemically reacting with the environmental um, material to make sure that these impacts can include um, both contamination of, uh, prevent contamination of both groundwater beneath these facilities and also surface waters. Spoil disposal is another of the uh, ground we have to check. So spoil and disposal, one for it can cause landslides or erosion. This can be reduced by drainage, compaction, and landscaping. Flooding by drainage water, the risk can be reduced again by containment in lagoons behind uh, well constructed dams with carefully timed releases um, to make sure that it doesn't make any natural water to flood. Turbid drainage, drainage water from mines or ore processing can smother aquatic plants and silt up rivers. So to prevent, again here, this is a natural process. It is the silt coming out of the water, uh, very fine grain that will, if not uh, filtered out, that will uh, cause turbid waters. This turbid water can be dangerous for the living fauna but this can be reduced beforehand by building sedimentation lagoons for the silt to sediment and let the rest of the water out of the system. Mine dewatering. So um, if an open pit or underground mines are closed or temporarily closed or put on standby, like we've seen in the uh, previous lessons for many causes like uh, a lack of money, uh, the metal uh, we are mining, the commodity, the price is going down. So the company is putting it on standby. If it is not uh, well uh, guarded and looked upon, well, the water will uh, pile up either in the open pit or the underground drift and so on. So um, this water, once the mine is going back, into production needs to be taken out. So after mining operations are completed, the removal and management of mine water 
often comes to an end and this can cause um, big uh, environmental uh, damages uh, resulting in possible buildup in rock, fractures, shaft, tunnels, drift, and open pits, and that can cause possible uncontrolled releases into the environment. We also have toxic leachate through wind and water. So the wind carries uh, by erosion toxic uh, mining waste, which can go in food webs and watersheds. Water draining from spoil heaps may contain toxic metal. This may be reduced by collection and chemical treatment. We also have toxic feature through wind and water. Wind carries by erosion, toxic mining waste, which can go in food and water chains, I said before. Example here is within the water. Uh, we've seen that sometimes we have the, like the uh, actual fauna uh, being uh, it, uh, intoxicated by these toxic leaches. Example here, uh, toxic leach of water, and again, natural phenomena with the chemical process of uh, oxidations of uh, iron rich. Uh, either soil or, or water just being oxidized by the air and the reaction causing the uh, red waters. We have uh, another environmental damage classified under erosion, but not a natural erosion, not from wind, but man-made erosion. And this happens often uh, within mining operations, which are, which are routinely modified the surrounding land, landscape by exposing previously undisturbed uh, earthen materials. Um, the soils contaminated from chemical spills and residues at mine sites may pose a direct contact risk. Um, the erosion of the soils and the mine waste into surface waters. The soil erosion impacts include the pH decreasing, which means going into the acidic environment, and metals loading to surface waters and or persistent contamination of groundwater sources. Contaminated sediments may also lower the pH of soils to the extent that vegetation and suitable habitat are lost because the environments are becoming more and more acidic. So we have what we call the acid mine drainage, the AMD, um, caused, and we'll see a little bit later on, but mainly from bacteria which eats iron sulfide, the FES, which uh, enrich soils and will create the sulfuric acids, the H2SO4, which can flow up within nearby water streams if not contained, if not well contained. And that was one of the major problems from the mines of the past. The acidic mine drainage and contaminant leaching metals such as gold, copper, silver, and molybdenum often occur in rock with sulfide minerals. These sulfides in the rock excavated and exposed to water and air during mining form sulfuric acid that can affect the entire ecosystem. And that was one of the major, major impact of our uh, unfortunately historical uh, over mines. If we move on within the habitat loss category for um, environmental damages, uh, we have animals uh, survival that depends on the soil conditions, the local climate, the altitude, and other features of the local habitat. Mining causes both direct and indirect damages to wildlife. Mining activities can be short-term impacts or long-term impacts, depending on how these are taken care of from the beginning. The habitat loss, the impact stem primarily from disturbing, removing, and redistributing the land surface, we call the overburden, as we saw. Well, that will affect both mobile and sedentary animals. But the mobile wildlife species, they have the, the advantage, like uh, game animals, birds, and predators, to leave the areas. Mostly, they will just move on. The sedentary animals, them, 
uh, like the invertebrates, the reptiles, the rodents, and smaller mammals, they will be the most affected because they are the ones staying in the uh, in the area. We also have what we call the habitat fragmentation due to man um, uh, man uh, machinery, uh, and this also affects a lot fauna and flora, uh, causes loss of species where minerals are to be extracted, which is unavoidable. Mm, removing wildlife by capturing the animals and transplanting the plants to move them to untreated uh, habitat has been attempted in the past, but the rate of success has been very low. Habitat restoration when mining has ended is carried out and that mostly works better than moving the habitat. The uh, habitat fragmentation impact leads to the reducing of large areas occupied by animals. Habitat are broken up into smaller and smaller patches, making dispersal by native species from one patch to another difficult or impossible and cutting off migratory routes. Uh, finally, for the habitat fragmentation, it can also cause isolation, which may lead to local decline of species or genetic effects, such as inbreeding. And we also have species that require large patches of forest, uh, and if they don't have that, they simply disappear. Just to complete what the other lessons we saw, I wanted to also uh, show environmental damages um for the uh, marine exploration so marine exploration is mainly done uh searching for new deposit through uh what we saw the geophysical seismic survey and these directly impact the whales so and they cause a lot of um a lot of these exploration surveys cause a lot of land and vegeta vegetation loss For social value, so that is another major branch of environmental damage. Um, social values damages vary from developed to underdeveloped countries. Um, mining projects may create jobs, roads, schools, and increase the demands of good, goods and services in remote and impoverished areas. But um, Within mostly underdeveloped countries, the benefits and costs may be unevenly shared, unfortunately. And so the local population who is mainly working in these mines are not really um, improving their lives. Most of social impacts happens when mine activities uh, cease, when they are gone in these areas and countries. Um, we have a double impact on these uh, societies. Uh, they lose completely any uh, sense of uh, work or possible employment, and these people are, are, are left to themselves. Mining projects can lead to many social and violent uh, tensions, conflictual tensions. Communities feel particularly vulnerable when linkages with authorities and other sectors of the economy are weak, or when environmental impacts of mining affect the subsistence and livelihood of local, local people. This happens a lot within the um, Southern America and African uh, mining sites. We have also, um, like I said, the main mining projects and violent conflicts and between two or several military valleys control the mine product. So that's also a question of power, power inequality within these countries, which can cause uh, major social conflicts. I have included a video showing one of the uh, greatest mine protestation into the uh, Peru country within South America showing the social uh, environmental damages uh, of the area. Another 
big social uh, impact is when we have the uh, what is called human displacement and resettlement. Uh, when we have entire communities which can be uprooted and forced to shift elsewhere, to move uh, often into purpose uh, built settlements, not necessarily of their own choosing or liking. Um, besides losing their homes, communities, they may also lose their land, their culture, and their livelihoods. These are ma major um, importance. We see them less in Quebec and in Canada, but we have seen them. Uh, one good example is in the Malartic town. Uh, these forced resettlement can be particularly disastrous for First Nation communities, uh, as we've seen a lot in South America, in Africa, but also we've seen some in Canada and the United States, who have strong cultural and spiritual ties to their lands and their ancestors and who may find it difficult to survive when these are broken. And uh, this uh, happens unfortunately more within the underdeveloped countries. Example here within our country, within Canada, of how population migration can affect. Even if um, the mine is opening and we have big population migrations because people are going, are going after these um, jobs, that can also cause a negative impact without even opening the mind because the cities where we have these big population migration increase were not built to receive as many people. So all the infrastructures, all the recycling, uh, all the cleaning, uh, all these cities, plumbing systems and so on are, were not built to receive as many people. So one of the most significant, significant impacts of mining activity is the migration of people into a mine area. This influx of newcomers can have a profound impact on the original inhabitants because they can also feel like they are being invaded in their own privacy and way of life. And sudden increases in population can also lead, lead to pressures on land, water and other resources, as well as bringing problems of sanitation and waste disposal. The land take, you can see that there are extraction that may cause conflicts with existing land uses. The minerals can only be exported where they are found. We saw that in the last lesson, so they cannot grow where we wish them to be, unfortunately. So wherever they are, this is the place that we need to mine them if we have to mine them. So makes land use conflicts more likely since there is a limited choice of locations that can be exploited. The loss of amenity and livelihood also can affect uh, everything that has to do with uh, uh, humanity, social values and so on. So often, often mining results and degraded soils, water biodiversity, and forest resources, which are critical to the subsistence of local people. Mining may cause aesthetic problems for local communities, and this may be reduced by landscaping and tree planting. The loss of amenity uh, and livelihood. Um, all mining projects must ensure that the basic rights of affected individuals and communities are upheld and not infringed upon. So, including the rights to control and use the land, the right to clean water, and the right to live in it. So, no companies should be leaving a site or an environment without the local people uh, having all the rights to have everything to live properly, like the land, the water, and so on. Climate change. This is a big, uh, big one uh, that is known to be caused again by um, mining industry. Mining, it's not all kinds of mines that can affect as much the mining industry. Uh, sorry, the climate change. Uh, the main mines that affect 
and climate change as seen here, 45% of these are coming from what we call the burning fuel for electricity and heat mines, mainly from coal, 20% of the world's primary energy demand, contributing to global warming through direct emissions when burned, but also through fugitive emissions that are released during the process of mining coal, but also from under the Earth's surface. So burning the fuel causes main and almost roughly half of the climate change uh, impact, and another uh, quarter, roughly, from the transportation of this material. So this is these are the two main areas we focus. If we move on to another factor that impacts humanity, people. Uh, uh, populations and so on cities is the public health. Contaminated substances and wastes in water, air, soil have serious negative impacts on public health. Consequences may cause or contribute to an increase of mortality or an increase in serious irreversible or incapacitating illnesses. Mm, unfortunately, again, many of these are directly or indirectly uh, set upon the mine, the mine employees, which have higher probabilities to undergo long problems in their lives due to their contact. So that is why the companies uh, for the several past years have uh, included a serious, serious programs to uh, where the safety equipment, individual safety equipment, and have teams uh, to make sure that these are respected for uh, for the protection of the mine and homes. We have the cultural and aesthetic resources. So for both possible direct and indirect impacts to cultural resources. Complete destruction of resource through surface disturbance or excavation. And we also have, can have the degradation or destruction due to uh, topographic or hydrological pattern changes, uh, or from soil movement, removal, uh, erosion, sedimentation, and so on. Examples also that were seen uh, mostly uh, in South America and uh, Europe. Uh, was the unauthorized removal of artifacts or vandalism as a result of increased access to previously inaccessible areas, and also the visual impacts due to clearing of vegetation, large excavations, dust, and the presence of large-scale equipment and vehicles. I've included also uh, for your own uh, visualization, the uh, gold mining video, if you want to see it. And it's, uh, its effects on the environment. So now we're going to move on to the mines, what, what we want to cover, the restoration uh, legislation. So within the mine life cycle, we are now within the fourth and final stage, the closure. A little overview before we go into details. So the mine closure is the last phase of the mining life cycle. It consists of the rehabilitation of all areas affected by the mining activities. And the mine closure, as, as we, we have seen in the last lesson, corresponds to when the ore extracting activities have ceased and the final decommissioning and mine reclamation is completed for different reasons, mainly running out of ore resources or declining of commodity or metal prices, which make the mine uneconomic to operate at a given time. Mines must plan their closure and restoration procedures before it opens and is in production. So this is a major uh, changing uh, legislation that has occurred and which was absent from all the historical mines uh, horror stories. And this 
is was defined to make sure that no more environmental uh, disastrous uh, effects would be done by the mining uh, companies. So there are four for the closure plans. These include four major objectives as defined by the Canadian Institute of Mining, the CIM. So they are done to mainly to protect the public health and safety, to alleviate or eliminate environmental damage, to achieve a productive use of land or a return to its original condition or an acceptable alternative. And finally, to the extent achievable, to provide for sustainability of social and economic benefits resulting from mine development and operations. As we've seen in the last lesson, when the mining companies must plan their closure and restoration procedures before its opening and its initial production. As this is done, it also has to set aside an approved budget before mining operations begin the mine for the post mining period. And this is mainly done for the, uh, the mine reclamation. So the, the mine reclamation process is um, of restoring the land has been mined to a natural or an economically usable state by ensuring that both vegetation and trees grow back and that no toxic waste runoffs. So as before the mine opens, as important as the plan is to set up the concept of the develop development of the mine and all its buildings and infrastructures, they will also have a plan set up with the step-by-step -step to restore that area to a respectable natural environment um, uh, process. The mandatory mine rehabilitation code from the uh, CIM includes the protection of openings to surface, the open pits, the stability of crown pillar room and pillar operations, the tailings of dams and other containment structures, surface water monitoring, the groundwater monitoring, the metal leaching and acid rock drainage requirements, physical stability monitoring, and finally the vegetation state. So as we've seen in the last few lessons, exploration, mining, reclamation, or closure. So the mine rehabilitation from the uh, CIM, the, rec the main recommendation, through training and experience acquired skills in the mining industry can be transferable to other economic activities, often within the same community. This is very important because community employment and economic opportunities such as the jobs and the business opportunities, so both uh, for the jobs that were created to work on the mine, so the trades personnel, the equipment operators, and the mechanics, security, first aid, etc., they would be used for within the business opportunity for the uh, end of the cycle. They could be on site for the site reclamation, the tree planting, the uh, setup of the drainage systems, the water sampling and analysis, and the security services. So these trades could be recycled to be present within the last phase of the mine. The mine validation recommendations, uh, okay, through the training and so on that we see. So this is an important factor as when the company leaves, at the same time, the company assures that uh, all the community within the area can be uh, economically active and have and secure their finances through ongoing work on the site for several years. So now we're gonna move on to the closure guidelines. And I'm just gonna give you some, like some, some important excerpts from uh, ma the major legislation. I've included in the documents uh, for this lesson, uh, many of these uh, official PDFs um, files, and I will also include on my slides the links, the important links for these uh, legislation. 
but for this presentation, I wanted to uh, generalize these so that the major knowledge of these can be uh, exerted within this lesson. So under the Mining Act, every corporation that carries out mining activities covered by reclamation requirements set out in the Mining Act, they must submit a closure plan to the uh, ministry, the MERN, Ministry of Energy and Resources of Quebec. So their closure plan, they need to have a closure permit requirement. That's one of the uh, requirements. The closure plan must be approved by the MERN before a mining lease can be issued. So before approving the plan and the amount of the financial guarantee that must accompany the plan, the MERN itself will consult the MELC. The MELC is the Ministry of Environment and the, their fight against the climatic changes. And the, this plan, importantly, is revised every five years. The closure plans are required uh, mandatory to give mandatory information, which must include a complete description of the following points site and mining activities that have been or will be carried out, the reclamation work to be performed during mining operation when applicable, the rehabilitation and reclamation work to be done when mining operations will end, the backfill uh, feasibility study for open pit type mines, the schedule of the phases of completion, the estimate of the expected cost for the reclamation work, and the financial guarantee Yes, the financial guarantee, that's a big point, major point. The amount must be equal to the expected cost of the entire reclamation work. So the financial guarantee, when the closure plan has been approved, the mining company must provide the MERN a financial guarantee in accordance with the standards set out in the regulation. They must be paid in three installments in two years following date on which the plan is approved. And the payment, the installments are done as follows. There is an initial installment covering 50% of the total amount of the guarantee within 90 days of receiving approval for the plan. So half of it is already paid before the mine is even constructed. Two subsequent installments, each covering 25%, of the total amount of the guarantee on the first two anniversaries of the date on which the plan was approved. We, I will just do a little bracket for temporary shutdown. Sometimes like we showed, some mines will shut down temporarily. Historically, some of these temporary shutdowns were not monitored and caused some uh, environmental uh, damages. And so the ministry also applied some legislations for these temporary shutdown to make sure that the both the mining company would not run off without being responsible. So for temporary temporary shutdown, for more than for more than uh, six months, the mining company must advise the ministry and the mill within ten days of the date operation cease. Within four months following the date of operation cease, the proponent must forward certified copies signed by an, an engineer or geologist of the plans if, it, if we are working, if it is an underground shutdown, uh, mining structures, including the mining structures, the surface facilities, and all existing tailing sites. If we are working at an exploration project stage, for a temporary shutdown, the mining company must provide a map indicating clearly all the features location used to restrict access and ensure the security of the site, and also include a schedule detailing the installation of its security measures and an inspection schedule. If we are working within an underground mining, uh, mining project, the mining company for a temporary shutdown must provide um, the following, including description of 
implemented measures to ensure public safety and environmental protection while mining operations are temporarily shut down. They must provide a detailed um, small scale, one to 5,000, that clearly a uh, detailed map, sorry, that clearly indicates the location of all security features like the barricades, the fences, the gates, concrete slabs, etc. They will also need to give surface openings and excavation must be sealed up or covered where appropriate. And finally, uh, they must also provide a schedule detailing the installation of security measures and an inspection schedule must also be provided to make sure that the site is not abandoned. For surface mining projects, the mining company must provide a description of all the intended measures ensuring public safety and environmental protection while operations are temporarily shut down. And these must include all the measures ensuring the safety of the surface openings, all the measures restricting access to the site, the buildings and other structures, the water management measures for the mine site, the environmental monitoring of the mine site, the methods used to store all types of chemical and petroleum products and all hazardous waste since the mine is temporarily shut down, all this material is sitting there on the mine site and has, has to be monitored. Measures it must also include the measures ensuring both physical and chemical stability of accumulation areas, particularly the tailings impoundment. And finally, also a schedule for installing security measures and an inspection schedule. For the assessment of post closure work, I've included uh, an example of the Louisville mine within the ABTB area of the uh, plan that was done. So I have a PDF file that was included with this lesson. And it will show um, how it was done. So basically it was an annual uh, assessment that was filled with the murn and the melt within 90 days of the end of the calendar year, as said before. And this summarized the work that has been done, the state of progress of the closure, Closure work in relation to the plan, expenses incurred in accordance with the closure plan, and finally, uh, the results of research and development, vegetation tests, and the progressive monitoring. So, you have to understand that a lot of these closed mining sites are becoming also the uh, field, field um, where a lot of uh, research teams go uh, to test either new methods, uh, new vegetation uh, to apply for the revegetation re 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 of the area, and also to monitor these studies. So this, this becomes um, nice uh, research playgrounds for the research team. Mainly, uh, I will not go through everything, but mainly within the Lubico area, uh, the example will show how the mine started and how the post post uh, closure activities were initiated. And uh, it is a case study showing all the legal aspects of the mine closing and the activities related to the the dismantling of the site and the performance of their telling pond and control with the uh, acidic rock drainage. The deadline for completion of closure work is also very important and is very um, constrained and there is a legislation to follow. Closure work must begin within three years of the cessation of operation. The moon may exceptionally require work to begin before this deadline or authorize an extension. An additional period may be granted for the first time for a period not exceeding three years and for additional periods not exceeding one year. I've also included another example. This time it's in Ontario for the Cote Gold uh, project closure plan done and defined by for um, the I am Gold company. 
and it will show an example of the certificate of release certificate of release which is um the uh, chapter one of the cha chapters for the uh, legislation and it will be issued when the moon is satisfied with the closure works and that the moon confirms that they have been completed in accordance with the closure plan approved by themselves and that there is no money due to the moon for the execution of the works and everything is conform to the agreement. The moon is satisfied that the condition of the land affected by the mining operations no longer poses a risk for both the environment or for the human health and safety, and in particular poses no risk of acid mine drainage, the AMD. So I just wanted to do a little parenthesis here for the um, um, uh, chemical processes so you understand the difference between the, the uh, AMD and the uh, NM which is the acidic mine drainage versus the neutral mine drainage. So what makes a mine a site have significant effects on the environment? Well, we have both the physical stability issues and the chemical stability issues. What are the uh, DMA and DMM? So the mine drainage contaminated by natural geochemical phen phenomena. The reaction between certain waste minerals and their environment. But understand that the waste minerals, we call them waste minerals, but they are natural occurring minerals. So for the acid mine drainage, the result of the natural oxidation process is either from chemical, electrochemical, or biological, like we saw before from bacteria, of sulfurous minerals found in rocky materials exposed to air and water. So it's a natural oxidation process. DMA drainage is uh, basically low pH, so within acidic uh, environments. And the high concentrations of heavy metals and soluble sulfates are within these sites with high concentration of dissolved solids. Um, they may also have contaminated neutral drainage and these, um, they reflect acidification of an area where there, uh, where there is be no, uh, no oxidations of the sulfide. So we can therefore have contaminants released as a result of oxidation, but at a neutral pH. This time we are within the uh, seven pH, which is not acidic. And uh, these are within high concentrations of heavy metals and soluble sulfates. And the mine range whose chemical quality is affected by passage through the mine waste, but which is not acidic as seen here uh, within, within time, the concentration of zinc within the time and within time, the concentration of the pH with the, it's made majorly uh, neutral around the 7, 7.5 uh, pH. This I've included so you can see the difference between uh, the uh, Mining Act um, legislation if you are within an exploration or a mining project. The closure needs to be considered throughout the life cycle as we've seen so far, and is not just happening at the last state or the post-closure uh, step. These several, these will show the several elements that must be considered in the closing of the mine planning and the closure of the mine planning is a cycle itself. So it will start with knowledge base, um, uh, using to define the plan, the closure, vision, the principles, and the objectives are defined with this knowledge. And then identifying and assessing and the opportunities, risks for this planning, the closure activities, the success criteria, the closure costs, and the closure execution plan to make sure that everything is monitored 
maintain and manage to make sure that this plan is certified. So the definition of satisfactory condition. At the top, I put the utopic visualization. We are moving from this environment to a perfect dream environment. Um, this is utopic, this is realistic. So we can still see some of the um, topography effect of the mining, but these are reduced and uh, revegetated. And so then the area can be reused for other purposes. So the aim of the site closure plan is to return the site to a satisfactory condition. That is the thing to remember. It will never be returned to its initial state. Eliminating unacceptable health hazards and ensuring public safety, limiting the production and spread of contaminants that should damage and receive um, environment, and in the long term, aiming to eliminate all forms of maintenance and monitoring, returning the site to a condition in which it is visually acceptable, which is called a reclamation, and returning the infrastructures areas, including the tailings, impoundments, and waste rock piles to a state that is compatible with future use. This is the rehabilitation. So this is the major thing to remember too, that of course, it will never come back to its initial state, but it will come back to a satisfactory state that will be used for future purposes. Several other uh, conditions or parameters must be added to the closure objectives. So it must include the company policies, guidelines, uh, resource timing, um, these are separated into the internal, so the company's considerations versus the external considerations. So the internal is the company's policy, policies, guidelines, resourcing, timing, and the site constraints, uh, the physical, technical, environmental, and workforce, and so on. For the external, it needs to take into consideration everything that has to do with the socioeconomic context, impacts and risks, so the local communities, the international guidelines and regulatory requirements, and finally, the stakeholders' inputs, community, and vision, public pressure. So both consideration, internal, external, will go into the closure objective. The red vegetation um, is considered as all areas affected by mining operations including the building sites, the tailing impoundments, the waste rock piles, and road surfaces and shoulders, they must be revegetated to control erosion and to control and to return the site to a natural appearance that blends with its surroundings. So natural appearance blending with its surrounding. That's two key uh, uh, terms here. The company must provide a report written by an agronomist belonging to a professional order, confirming the adequacy of both conditions to support sustainable vegetation in all revegetated parts of the site, and the use of fertilizing residuals or soil for the revegetation purposes must, com must comply with all laws, regulations, policies, and uh, guidelines. So this, again, we need a professional to say that the work has been done using all the right uh, methods and the results are satisfactory. For the contaminated land, uh, we need to characterize and rehabilitate uh, the contaminated land. So a characterization study certified by an expert authorized by the government must be submitted to the regional branch of the milk if the study reveals the presence of contaminants in a concentration exceeding the regulatory uh, limit values, the proponent must submit a request for the approval of a land rehabilitation plan. The management of contaminated excavated soils must include um, excavated soils whose metal or metalloid contamination results 
from mining operations must be stored in detailing areas related to the operations and for which conditions were established in the certificate of authorization issued by the mill. The management of contaminated excavated soils must comply with the laws, regulations, policies, and guidelines presented in the document uh, called the Interation Guide, Soil Protection, and Contaminated Site Rehabilitation. So again, we need to move from the operated mining site, possibly contaminated land, to a complete revegetalized area which complies with the environmental um, look and um, uh, characteristics. For the buildings, infrastructure, and equipment, the buildings and surface infrastructures, all the buildings and surface infrastructure must be dismantled unless the proponent can show that they are necessary to achieve and maintain a satisfactory condition to monitor and maintain infrastructure or to support the area's socioeconomic development. All the concrete foundations in the ground may remain if they are free of contamination and if they pose no risk to the environment. Two regulations to comply with, we have the regulation respecting the landfilling and incineration of residuals materials and the good practices guide for managing dismantling materials of the milk. For underground infrastructures, any opening or access to the underground workings, uh, service tunnels, pipeline, drifts, or any support infrastructure, waterworks, culverts that will remain in place must be sealed off and decontaminated if required. The proponent must provide a plan signed by an engineer indicating the location and nature of the uh, decontamination work, if applicable. The transportation of uh, transportation infrastructure, again, the main road access to the mine site must be kept in good condition, along with secondary roads used to monitor and ma maintain the mine site infrastructure. The land must be reclaimed as follows. The tailings, waste rock, or other contaminated material used in their construction must be removed. The bridges and culverts must be removed to restore the natural flow of any water banks. The banks of rivers and streams must be stabilized by planting vegetation. The road drainage ditches must be filled in unless they are needed to access the site and the natural flow should be restored and backfield surfaces should be leveled and planted to prevent any erosion. So the mine site roadways may be left intact along with uh, all related infrastructures if they are in good condition and will not harm the environment. All the surface equipment uh, machinery now, uh, they, they must be removed from the site all the mining equipment, head cranes, hoists, pumps, conveyors, etc. All the ore processing equipment, the grinding mills, the flotation cells, the sanitation tanks, the thickeners, etc. All the heavy machinery, the motor vehicles, the drills, the shovels, blah, 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 etc. All that, they must all be removed from the site. The strip areas uh, and excavations, example for bulk sampling, has to be um, put back as much as possible to a natural uh, topography of the area. So the excavations and strip areas must be backfilled where appropriate and slope gradients reduced and the land level to blend with the surrounding natural topography. For the open pits, the pits can be filled with unconsolidated deposits, mineral substances, tailings, or waste rock. In order to be considered environmentally acceptable, the chemical and physical stability of the backfill must be demonstrated in the short and long term. The, uh, for the accumulation areas, the reclamation of accumulation areas must 
they must attain technical, environmental, and social objectives. The following installations must be stabilized. The containment structures, the, west, the waste rock piles, the tailing area, and all retention structures. Finally, the reclamation must consider the potential future uses of, for the site, and the reclaimed areas must blend with in the natural landscape topography. Uh, for the, these uh, accumulation areas, we need to uh, have their geotechnical characterization using two main conditions. The company must set up on-site testing equipment and collect data to assess the geotechnical properties of materials currently stored or to be stored in uh, accumulation areas. And uh, they must develop an instrumentation and sampling program in which stratigraphic units are well represented and the installed instruments and collected samples are adequate and sufficiently representative for the characterizations of the materials. And these mainly include the RQD measurements. The, for the waste rock piles, so uh, select. Selecting the location of waste rock piles is very important. Uh, it impacts the chosen reclamation technique. The management methods of these uh, waste rock piles um, is either to use the waste rock as underground backfill or moving waste rock into the pit if applicable. The pile construction using benches and compacted layers and the various methods for cold de uh, depositing tailings and waste rock that can help improve the geotechnical stability of the pile by, by mixing two uh, tailing and or, and or waste rock. Certain waste rock management methods can reduce the geotechnical risk associated with waste rock and in some cases closure costs. For the tailing areas, the company must focus on their analysis on the siding of the tailings impoundment, the sedimentation basins, the choice of the tailing storage, and the management methods for uh, use, either pulp, thick and paste, uh, or filtered. Example, the use of tailings as underground backfill or the transfer of tailings into the open pit. The tailings management methods that reduce the retention structure required, for example, filtered tailings and various methods for co-depositing tailings and waste rock that can, that can help improve the geotechnical stability of the tailings areas. The geochemical characterizations of these accumulation areas uh, under the metal mining influence regulations. Uh, so they have their own legislation. The reclamation of the tailings areas and waste rock piles must prevent the generations of acidic mining drainage and the natural denutral uh, mining drainage. The main factors in attaining chemical stability objectives for tailings and waste rock are uh, either a relevant education and expertise of professionals responsible, the recognition of climatic conditions and the physical characteristics of the accumulation area, the tailings and waste rock management methods implemented during the operations phase, and the controls on the geochemical behavior, which also take into account the geotechnical behavior or the stability of the uh, uh, the accumulation areas. Dewatering sedimentation and pollution basins. So dewatering sedimentation and pollution basins must be emptied and reclaimed unless they are still needed. The natural flow should be reestablished within the uh, using the natural topography of the area and the treatment sludge and sediments that accumulate on the bottom of the basins are considered to be tailings. For the groundwater, for the groundwater quality in the vicinity of any developed area at risk must comply at all times with the protection requirements. 
a little bracket here for the petroleum industry, the petroleum uh, products, just to know that these uh, legislations, the responsibility of the petroleum industry has been divided into April 207 between the uh, RBQ, Régie du Bâtiment du Québec, the MELC, and the MERN. The MERN will take the responsibility for the marketing of the petroleum products, while the RBQ becomes responsible for all matters related to petroleum equipment, and the MELC becomes responsible for the environmental aspects of the petroleum industry. Moving on to the post closure monitoring and maintenance, that is also very important because uh, as much as a company wants to make the best work, sometimes uh, some non-seen or uh, unobserved uh, interpretations lead to uh, future contamination without uh, the company uh, knowing if there is no uh, tracking for uh, medium, short, medium, and long-term uh, time. So the objective is to track the environmental performance of the closure work. Uh, it also aims to ensure the sustainability of the infrastructure and plant cover, and to assess whether the mine site has attained a satisfactory condition. This is the video from the uh, Canadian Institute of Mining that um, you can go see by your own time, which shows the integrated mine closure good practice. I wanted to show here an example of a project as you move from a greenfield project status to a brownfield project status. As seen in other lessons, greenfield project status is when you start a new project. When you start a, a new project, you move from, or you work with lots of unknowns. You have many models to evaluate. You have lots of education to do, and you are doing or moving on one status at a time. When you move on into a ground field project, you have real data from your study. Um, you have numbers from production. You have stakeholders that have knowledge, and you have many statuses at the same time. Basically, uh, when we use the term brownfield, that means we are within a mining project or a mature mining camp. Example, moving on with the case study of Troilus. So when it was at its, its um, exploration, greenfield, um, Prospection state. Uh, the permitting that was needed to move on this project was prospection permit, drilling intervention permit, trenches intervention permit. Once the discovery was done and uh, we needed to have future studies to uh, make sure that this deposit would move on to a or state or A or ranking, we need to do some bulk sampling. So the bulk sampling, we need the intervention permit, the certification of authorization, and a small closure plan. Once we move on to the Brownsfield test, we have uh, the technical activities and impact assessment. So we're moving on from scoping to pre-feasibility to feasibility, to detailed engineering, and that requires the feasibility level project description. And moving on to the construction, operation, and closure of the mine, each need the monitoring reports. Example for the uh, Troilus case study, we have the, all the, the list of permits that were needed to move on from a exploration project to a mining project. We needed, of course, the first intervention permit, including drilling, the tree cutting, etc. We needed the land use lease for any road, building, waste pile. 
We needed to have a project notice. We need to have studies, impact studies, both for the provincial and federal government. We need, needed to have the mining lease. Then we needed to have the closure plan, including all the financial guarantees budget. Finally, we had uh, uh, fauna permits. We also had archaeology permits. Uh, archaeology permits uh, for us, mainly in Quebec and Canada, are for the surface and subsurface uh, studies, where we have archaeological teams coming in and uh, digging for some artifacts that can be found within an area so that it is done prior to uh, the uh, mine construction so that these are not lost. And finally, we have the construction permits. So example here from the case study, the, uh, tro for the Troilus, it was um, one of the first to have uh, built community relations. It was the first IBA in Northern Quebec at the, at the time. The IBA is the impact and benefit agreement with the uh, First Nation population. Um, it was uh, an agreement with the Cree community of Mississippi, but it also included the Shibugamo, Chape, and Uche uh, Bugamo. And many regional people worked at the mine. So all the PDF files uh, and the uh, that I have given to Shao for this study, for this lesson. I've also included their links, their website links, and I've also included their PDF uh, file formats, if you are interested. So these include the Quebec's Guide to Mining Restoration in Quebec, the Integrated Mine, mine Closure from the uh, CIM, the Minister of Environment and Fight Against uh, Climatic Change, website, the Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources website, the Mining Act, the regulation and respecting mineral substances uh, other than petroleum, natural gas and wine uh, chapter from the legislation, the Environment Quality Act, and finally the uh, directive pertaining to the mining industry. Mm, unfortunately for now, it is mainly uh, only available in French. I've also included uh, some uh, references for specific actual uh, environment impacts that we hear in the news. First two for the um, Iron uh, Lake Bloom uh, area. And the third one is for the Red Waters from uh, the Shefferville area. And finally, I've included the website that lists a lot of programs and knowledge that impacts the participation of First Nations within uh, mining uh, companies or mining uh, projects. And before uh, showing the uh, one, an example video of a rehabilitation uh, for a gold mine, just wanted to move on and show the mine rehabilitation in the future, which is taken very seriously uh, to prevent any of the historical horror stories. And um, I've included the, all of the main uh, PDF for these files too. So these show that the mines, as we all know, provide the critical minerals and metals needed for modern society. But these resources are not properly damaged and the mining activity can impact local environments and biodiversity if they don't follow the uh, uh, legislation. Nowadays, the mines prepare for rehabilitated landscape right from the beginning in a process known as progressive reclamation. So the Natural Resource Canada government entity funded the development of what is called the Canadian Minerals and Metals Plan, and that supports supports uh, sustainable mining practices throughout the mining life cycle. It is a milestone in Canada's mining history because it includes visionary principles 
and strategic directions that governments, industry, and stakeholders can pursue to drive industry competitiveness and long-term success. This is a generational initiative and will raise Canadians' awareness of the importance of the mineral sector. It will respond to ongoing and emerging challenges for all its impacts on the uh, communities, and it will help position Canada for opportunities offered by an evolving economy. So I have included the links to either the websites or the web, also the documents uh, PDF slides. So the main, the Canadian Minerals and Metal Plans have extracted some of the main um, chapters, uh, just a little summary. So for the environment, what they see is a continu continual reduction of mining environment footprint, a circular economy where mine waste is transformed into useful products and environmental liabilities reduced, enhanced mine closure planning and environmentally reclaimed mine sites, and the systematic climate change adaptation planning, and all this to uh, their goal for protection of Canada's natural environment, uh, underpins a responsible competitive industry. Canada is a leader in building public trust and developing tomorrow's low footprint mines and managing the legacy of past activities. They have a vision, it was started in 2019 and they have a planned vision through 2025. These areas of action include the reducing of waste, the alternative and renewable energy, the circular economy, the reclaiming mine sites, and the climate change adaptation. They also have included, based on the uh, Lasson curve that we've seen in the last lesson, the mineral exploration and mining sequence. So I included the PDF and I've included just a little zoom in of the image here. So with all the steps we've seen so far, from the pre-exploration to exploration and so on, to the closure and post-closure of a mine. Their minor closure and rehabilitation is also um, graphically well uh, designed as seen here, showing everything from before mining during mining and after mining, and this comes with their uh, long-term plan. What is progressive mine reclamation? As stated in that plan, the process of a progressive reclamation, also known as rehabilitation, plans for post-closure activities during the mine process before moving the first bit of dirt and off to the last truck leaving the mine. So that is a big difference with the historical uh, project. This is taken into consideration from start, during, and after the project. There are three stages to the mining process, each with its own associated activities to plan for mine reclamation. So we have before mining, which integrates mine planning for closure and reclamation. We have during mining, so planning for climate change impacts and land use. And finally, after mining, the closure and reclamation processes. While these are distinct stages, three continuous processes occur throughout the sequence of the, mine, the mining life cycle. We have the continuous monitoring. We have the continuous engagement with uh, First Nation people, their communities, and regulation. And we have the continuous updates to ensure closure and reclamation plans complement any modifications to the mine plan. So these are uh, summarized here, but again, you will have the complete document if you are interested. So again, the main points uh, for each process is meant to be inclusive, continuous, and responsive to the constantly changing environment to ensure there is flexibility and preparedness to adapt as necessary for each major step before, during, and after mining. Um, also, as seen in this 
uh, lesson in the first part where for the damages and impacts. Importantly, the Canadian mineral plants, uh, minerals and metal plants also include mining operations that can generate opportunities for new business to create local benefits. So reverting mines to a rehabilitated state will also ensure that the landscape can continue to support life for centuries to come. Um, the Canadian Minerals and Metals Plan supports the vision for progressive mine rehabilitation to ensure Canada remains responsible uh, mining through our house for generations to come. So I've included uh, three videos. I'm going to show uh, the last one today, the other two. If you are comfortable with uh, the French uh, speaking language, you can go and see them on your own time. We're mainly going to see a, a good example for a gold rush um, mining company uh, that has uh, shown their land reclamation, the process of it, and the results from, from it, from their work. For when your special delivery arrives, meet the Google It's Finally Here Notifier, Nest Hub Max from Google. I know it looks bad. It looks like a big hole in the earth, but what you can't see is what we're gonna do. I've been a miner all my life. Um, it's my profession and I take it seriously and I think my dad always taught me to be stewards of the land, and as you take something away, whether it's you make your business in a town, you give back to the town. If you have a relationship with people, you give back to the people. Well, it goes the same with our earth. We take the gold out, and we need to put it back. So he's always instilled that in me. Good miners, as they mine, they always have the end product in mind. Reclamation's expensive. Every irresponsible miner that does reclamation is always a uh, there's always an issue between spending money that doesn't recover any costs. Basically, this does nothing but cost us money. It doesn't do anything for the bottom line. But it's the right thing to do. We pulled gold out of here, and uh, this provided a living for us. And now it's time to put something back. This topsoil has everything in it to grow. It's got all the seeds, all the spores. It's got uh, very rich compost. So this is a little bit above and beyond what we're required to do, and we're just going the extra mile. And we've kind of discovered what works around here, so the most important, critical thing we can do is put the topsoil back on. So you can see how fast things grow. If you look over there, you can just start to see green. And that was actually in three months. Three months ago, we removed it from its natural state, put it up there, and it's already growing. It looks, looks bad now, but in uh, three years, you will never know that we mine here. They start with an end in mind. So when we started this, our end goal was to reclaim this site. So we mined it according to that plan, knowing that we're gonna reclaim it. So yeah, it's. It's true and dear to my heart is the reclamation. So I'm glad to share it with you guys. And uh, hopefully we can see this in about three years. It'd be nice to come back, take some pictures and see what it looks like. So this ends this week's lesson. Sorry, I'm having some trouble with my camera. Okay, no problem. <laughs> okay, for some weird okay, reason. All right, uh, uh, camera decided to let me down. So, uh, well, Francine, thank you once again for some uh, really insightful uh, webinar.
it was really interesting. Just let me try one more time. Okay, well, people can see me. It's not a problem. Uh, once again, thank you very much. If you've made it this far, we really appreciate it. Um, as usual, if you have any questions that may come up after viewing this uh, specific webinar, just email us at info at iddpnql.ca. We'll make sure to get uh, the most accurate answer and we'll get it back to you as soon as possible. Uh, for those of us that are attending, we will see you in two weeks for uh, our 11th installment. And the last one will be early in December. And I think that pretty much sums it up. So uh, be safe, have fun, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.